I'm Carol Reynolds, and I'm delighted to be here with David Lovren, who has so many roles with the Dallas Winds. Many of you will know him as this extraordinary player of saxophone, which um, I guess is what started you off in the, the world of music. But in your long and rich career, you find yourself today as a staff arranger for the Dallas Winds. You do many other kinds of technological and, and logistical jobs for the Dallas Winds. And I guess maybe one of the first things I could say, good morning. Uh, but uh, I just, whenever I think of the Dallas Winds, uh, I think of you doing um, just about everything these days. And these days that role has changed a lot. Well, thank you, Carol. It's great to be talking to you this morning. Um, yeah, it, it's been an interesting year, obviously, for all of us. And the Winds are no different. We, um, have had to find new and interesting ways to get our music out to people. And I, I, I'm glad to have uh, had a role in that. Um, is this something when you think back a year ago and you think about how many uh, creative avenues artists in general, but particularly musicians have found, does that kind of make you happy to think back in all that? Is that opening new doors that wouldn't have been open before? Well, that's a great way to think about it. We, um, you know, with as with all the arts groups in around the world, we had to rethink how we get our message out and how we get our music out. And uh, we, with the limited things we had uh, in the early part of the pandemic, we decided to start a serenade series where we did live streaming of of just small uh, ensembles. And we did a series of seven of those. We call them summer serenades at first. And then we call them autumn serenades as we change seasons. But uh, those were very successful. Uh, our staff and crew and, and everyone uh, learned a lot about uh, live streaming and being portable and flexible and uh, taking opportunities and we were able to bring you know, those seven shows, which was great because we could do something that both benefited the winds, uh, gave us a message to get out there in the limited avenues we had, and also gave us uh, an opportunity for our musicians to, to make a little money uh, in a time when musicians have really been suffering. That's really something. And of course, reaching around the world, which brings me to the title of this upcoming concert, Around the World in 60 Minutes. Now, um, uh, tell me about that. Uh, you know, yeah, my first thought is, you know, around the world, really, really? Are we going around the world? Because if you look at the pieces that we've been publicizing, uh, we never really get out of Europe. You know, it's it, we start over in Ireland and then we're like England, Scotland, Italy, Germany, and then we get over into Russia at the end, but uh, we only get to, you know, St. Petersburg. If you look at that that piece, Shostakovich composed the folks' dances as part of a suite, which was all about Leningrad. So we're really still in the European part of Russia. We're we're not even out of the continent of of Europe. So um, all I can say is is that I did have uh, some input into naming the the show and. Um, I just have to leave it at there are a couple of pieces that aren't in the published um, advertising material. So, well, you'll have to tune in to see uh, which which other continents we hit. Aha. So it's a surprise journey. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> well, yeah. the, the Dallas Winds is all about surprises all the time. And uh, that's partly why you're so beloved, um, because some things are set and some things are unexpected. Um, when you were a kid in band and embraced playing the sax, uh, little probably could you have imagined all the things you do, particularly the, the tremendous job you have in arranging music, which is something that younger kids don't even probably know exists, but particularly in these times, you are having to do some serious reconfigurations so that the music will work for the times. And, and on this program, you have two major arrangements. Can you tell us about those? Well, uh, Jerry had come up with a list of repertoire for our March concert and our April concert. And um, we had to look at that with, from the eyes of, of having only a very limited number of players, um, you know, between 15 and 20 on stage maximum. 
uh, due to the current Meyerson restrictions. And so we went out looking for repertoire that we could that, that would work well for smaller groups of instruments. There are a couple of resources online which have great lists of, of wind repertoire uh, that work for smaller groups. I'll, a couple of pieces popped into my head. I suggested them to Jerry and said that I'd be willing to um, adapt them. And in this case, it was actually fairly straightforward. That's, that's one of the reasons I, I volunteered to do it because the Rodrigo is actually a very chamber music-y kind of a, a piece, lots of exposed solos. And there are quite a few parts, the, the third and fourth horn part and, 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 and you know, the lower trumpet parts, which don't have a lot to do in, in the piece. And um, I, I, it was clear to me that if I just took some of the um, deeper harmonies and just transferred them all over to a piano, that we could do this with much, quite a few fewer people. I think it's 16 total. And then uh, folk dances is, is basically a polka band arrangement. You know, that's, that's, that's how I think yeah. of it. Yeah. So, so we just uh, take the umpas over to the piano and, uh, and, and give the rest of the French horns a rest and, uh, and, and let everybody else play their normal parts. That's the nice thing about both these arrangements is that most of the band is just playing the published parts and we've just uh, shuffled around the leftover notes after we, um, reduce the number of players and it works out really well for, for this particular uh, set of pieces. The, uh, the process of doing an arrangement, I kind of wonder what that looks like. And again, if we have students out there who might be high schoolers who already are becoming, you might say more sensitive to the arrangements that they play, because at a certain point as you grow as a student, you start thinking about that, right? And it's, it's not just a given. Um, what do you do? Do you sort of just walk around in, in, a, in a, on a pretty nature walk and imagine the sound you want? Or do you get in there and just grapple like chopping up onions and peppers? How is it? <laughs> well, it's um, every arranger, composer has to spend time studying other people's scores anyway. So this is just was just an opportunity for me to to crack open a couple of, of scores of pieces that I, I really love and and try to uh, just reimagine them a little bit. And um, it's, it's a, a interesting process. I, I kind of, I, I do go on walks and I do think about this stuff, but uh, a lot of it just happens reading through the score. You're, you're looking at um, the, the, you know, the top of the list, the priorities of just handing out the notes, you know, it's like, okay, is this covered? Is this covered? Is this covered? Is this covered? And then, uh, the rest of it is uh, rebalancing, you know, um, if you're, you know, you, you have this piece in your head, you're hearing it as 50 people on stage. And now we're talking about 15 or 16 people on stage. And uh, you actually you, you jump at that opportunity because you know that lines can come forward and, and interact in ways that they wouldn't be with just, you know, three times as many sound generating points on the stage. So uh, it, it, it's really, it's great creative work. It's great study work to see, you know, what the masters are doing in their scoring. And, and so it's, it's a learning process for me as well as generating something useful for, useful for the ensemble. I, I love the way you worded that because the science of all this, which is something people forget that music is one of the great sciences, you know, that, that the acoustic, science of acoustics and, and all the engineering of production of sound through instruments. Um, and in a way that's, that's the mathematical side is, as well as the artistic side coming together. Does that work to get it? There's so, there's so much to, that goes on our performance, you know, from the musical preparation, uh, actually the preparation of the sheet music ranging in this case. And, and then we had the actual performance. And then now that I've been in the live stream booth for these last two concerts, I see how much is involved in just getting that image and that sound recorded and broadcast, you know, and the, the Meyerson is fantastic for that. They um, just within the last year, they upgraded their, their camera and their sound system there. They have like the, they have eight cameras set up around 
the hall and they're all, you know, they're pan and tilt and zoom. There are these remote control cameras all over the hall that we have complete control over in the, in the booth. And then uh, um, fantastic staff there at the Meyerson um, cameraman and our, our sound guy, George, and our, our cameraman, Cameron, um, they pipe all that great mixed sound in, in, right into uh, our broadcast. And then we, we coordinate the cameras and uh, it, it's all exciting. The, and I, I think the, the live streams have come off really well, these last two concerts. And uh, uh, it, it's definitely a fun way to watch the group. And so the thing to do is come to the concert if you're within striking distance. Uh, get those tickets and you can be among 300 in the hall, right? Is that's the limit for this? That's uh, my understanding is that, the, yeah, we were taking three, we can take 300 in the hall and um, and then unlimited on the live stream. So and do both even. So quickly get among those 300 so you can be back in that magic of live music with players who are, I think it's fair to say, very psyched to be back up on stage, right? And right, right. It, it gives you the excitement. Uh, you know, the option, whether you want the excitement of, of just being there live and enjoying everything the way we traditionally do, or if you want that um, live stream ex experience that you could, especially if you can't make it to the concert, you know, um, be, whether you have a, a conflict or you're just out of the area, you can watch that live stream anytime for several days after the concert. Yeah. So it's a double, a double whammy and it's perfect. Um, well, thank you. That's, that's a lot to think over. And as always, there's, there's the, the, the instant joy of being in a in music situation, but then there's everything that's behind it. And I think the more we know about that, the richer our experience will be. Yeah. Uh, every performing group in the world is dealing with this right now. And uh, I'm happy that, you know, we've had great support, uh, from the board and the staff to find new ways to get our, our message out there. And, uh, and even when things are back to whatever the new normal is and, and we're doing our normal concerts at the Meyerson to full crowds, uh, I hope we still keep doing the, uh, the, the live streaming and, and putting our message out there because uh, it, it's a great way to re reach an audience outside the Metroplex. And, and boy, the audience needs that music, especially the wonderful repertoire, surprises and all, that will be at any concert with the Dallas Winds. David, thank you for your time. And we'll see you at the concert, yeah? One way or the other, right? Uh, we'll be there behind the scenes, uh, running the cameras and stuff. And, and I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you, Carol. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you.